Good morning. Hello, everyone. Good morning for the Europeans. Good afternoon for those that are in Asia or in Australia. My name is Rafa Pedrazola. I'm the Global Technical Manager for SWINE uh, at EW Nutrition. First of all, and on behalf of the entire EW Nutrition team, I would like to welcome you to this uh, webinar. Thank you for taking the time to join us and also for adapting to this new way of working as a consequence of the coronavirus pandemic that we are living today. Um, I'm not alone here today because I have two colleagues with me, two panelists. Uh, they are gonna help me in two main aspects. Uh, one on the technical coverage and another one they will assist me with, uh, with some of the questions. So I would like ask them to, to introduce uh, themselves. So Felipe, please, would you mind to, to introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Rafa, of course not. So thank you and good morning and good afternoon to everybody that is joining us today. It's a pleasure for us to be here. It's a pleasure to have you together with us. Uh, as Rafa said, I'm Felipe Barbosa. I'm from Brazil. I'm leading the global technical team for swine here at Ida Nutrition. Uh, Germany. I, I'm working with the swine industry for the past 10 years and since 2014 I'm based here in Germany uh, visiting customers worldwide. The idea here is today to support Hafa, to support you with your questions and do it together with my colleague Federico. Federico, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to the European uh, colleagues. Uh, I'm Federico Storga. I'm the technical manager in UW Nutrition for Solter Europe and uh, another Spanish guy. And if you remember, Spain is the third biggest uh, swine producer in the world. This means that uh, because of that, <laughs> we are two Spanish guys in, in this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Okay, thank you very much for, for your support. And also, I wanted to thank you to, to my colleagues in the marketing team because they have uh, helped us with the, all the technical stuff uh, and all the communication of this uh, webinar. Thank you, Mariana, Ilinka, Chris, and also Julia. So let me explain you very briefly um, how this is going to work. Uh, I will start in, in a few minutes, in one minute, and my talk will last more or less uh, around 40, 42 minutes, something like that. And at the very end of my presentation, we will have uh, we will open the turn for the questions and, and answers. We will have around 20, 30 minutes to all, all the questions that you may have. Also, you can formulate questions during my speech just by clicking on on the on the uh, at the bottom of the um, of your screen. There is a, a box what, uh, with a question mark. Right, and some of them will be will be answered through my colleagues, or maybe we can bring some of them to the to the final debate. Okay, good. So for today's webinar, we have chosen a topic that is is a very old topic, I would say. It's of course strep suisse, and there are three main reasons to to choose this uh, to choose this bacteria. Of course, it's a very truly relevant pathogen for the swine industry today. And also, it is an emerging pathogen in, in some markets. Lately, and unfortunately, strep suisse is becoming more and more famous because the outbreaks of, uh, uh, that this bacteria is causing in humans, specifically in Asia or in China, uh, and, but also in some, other, in some other regions. And additionally, and if we look at the future, I believe that uh, with the scenario that is ahead of us in some of uh, our markets with the lower tools to control bacteria, I think that strep is, is one of these bacteria that we are going to work uh, in the near future. Okay, so let's do it. This is the agenda that we have for today. I will start with a small introduction. After that, I will go for just a review, brief uh, review about the pathogen and the things that have been in, in the past. I would like to share with you what is the science telling us today regarding strep suisse, uh, uh, current information. And also I will, I will like to review with you 
what is the future for, for this bacteria. Uh, we will try to cover some of the some of the strategies that probably we need to, to, to pay attention to control this strep suisse. And at the very end, one slide for the conclusions, and then directly we'll go to the, to the question and answer uh, round. Good. Um, I would like to start my presentation with this picture and with one question for you, because this is something that I am wondering myself, and what is going to happen with the global uh, meat market? Because only the speaking, I believe that we we are being seriously affected by two small viruses. So on the left you can see the coronavirus, and on the right you can see one new, very impacting new, that uh, is related to the African swine fever. So you know very well how coronavirus is affecting to us, to our to our lives, to our professional lives, to our personal lives, uh, to our meetings, to our congresses. Um, but the truth is. What is going to happen? So who of you can predict what is going to happen in the near future? So the reality, the truth is that today we are starting to see very bad news, I would say, because if you pay attention, if you look to the, to the prices of the pigs that are going down in many markets, uh, on the other hand, the prices for the raw materials are going up. In many, in many markets and regarding the consumption is unstable today and also i don't know if you're familiar with two news that i read yesterday there are a couple of uh, meat processors in the united states that are shut down uh, smithfield foods and, and gbs are, are closing their operations in the united states so the question is what is going to happen and also on the other side on the right side on, on the on the on the slide you can see uh, one really impacting new coming from the from China. So China newly approves 454 companies to import, which is very good news for these countries that are exporters. But the question is, for how long? So there are some also news on the press that uh, China, luckily, is recovering uh, fast from their uh, shortage, but. What will happen in the near future with the with the meat market? So, what will happen here, for instance, in Europe, if finally the African swine, uh, swine fever virus is able to cross from Poland to Germany? This will affect to the global meat market, right? So, if I had to summarize this slide or the future, this is my personal feeling. Uh, looking at the future, if I have to select one word, which is uncertainty right so but this is not all because um in this scenario that we now that we are living now there is a new component and this new component is that we are our sector our industry is receiving some pressure and uh this slide is reflect pretty well what is happening today so there is an increasing pressure to reuse all the substances that we are having to control some of the main pathogens so governments are, are not authorities are regulating, for instance, the incoxide in Spain, in Europe, that uh, in, in, in more, in less than one and a half year will be banned, or what happened in China or in Russia this year at the beginning of 2020. They ban the use of uh, uh, antibiotics as growth promoters. Or what happened in Brazil four, four months ago, five months ago, they banned the use of tylosine or the use of thiamoline or the use of lincomycin as a growth promoter. So with this scenario and with, with the uncertainty that we are living today, we are going to see the pathogens on a different way. And when we are talking about pathogens, we have different ones. So on the upper uh, part of the slide, you can see the main bacteria organized by uh, systems. Right. This is the bacteria that are affecting to the respiratory systems. This is the one that are affecting through the digestive system. And these are the ones that are uh, systemic. And below you can see the virus. Of course, this chart may vary between uh, countries. Of course, uh, companies and genetics have uh, different status. But what is true is that with this new scenario that we are that is in front of us, that is, that is ahead, of, ahead of us, some of the pathogens that you will fight with in the future are reflected in this in this slide 
And of course, as you can imagine, one of them is strep suisse. Strep suisse is uh, this bacteria. This is a very nice picture from Nature uh, Journal, uh, trying to reflect which is the evolution of the capsule, the lipopolysaccharide capsule of the, of the bacteria, depending on how the infection, how the disease, how the bacteria uh, is uh, finding on the status of infection, right? <clears throat> Good. As you can imagine, I'm not going to cover the general things about the, the pathogen because you can read some books. Of course, you can go, you can find all the information related to, to the general things about step suicide on, on our Bible, on our uh, diseases of swine. This is uh, one of the best books I, I know yes, regarding the swine production. Just a very uh, brief remind about the main characteristics. You know very well that this is a gram-positive and encapsulated bacteria. You know very well that it's affecting to 100% of the farms. Oh, pay attention because uh, this doesn't mean that all the, the, all the animals are infected. So the prevalence can vary between three and 30%. Of course, the clinical signs could start at the farrowing, uh, at the farrowing uh, lactation, uh, at the farrowing period, and also can vary between uh, five and, and, and 10 weeks. I have to say that the most common uh, moment where the disease is appearing is between two and three weeks post uh, weaning. You know very well which are the main clinical symptoms. You know very well that is a zoonosis. And regarding the serotypes, we could, we could say that in general, there are <clears throat> 35 serotypes no, <clears throat> in the world. However, there is a, a, a little bit discussion <clears throat> between the different scientists because some of them, some of the serotypes, they think that they belong to another different genera. But uh, I would say that I, I'm not wrong if I'm saying that the most predominant serotypes worldwide are the number two, the number nine, and the number three, right? Despite there are some differences between regions and, and countries. For instance, in Asia, the most common ones are the two and three. Here in Europe, uh, we have the two, the nine, and, and 14. Or in the United States, we have the one slash uh, two, seven, three, eight, and, and all these things. Maybe there are uh, needed more resources or more epidemiological studies uh, regarding the steps to this, okay? Good. Regarding the transmission of the pathogen, we know that, uh, as I said, that 100% of the farmers are infected, to my knowledge. Among them, we can find between four, uh, 40 and 80% of the animals infected with the bacteria. Again, this doesn't mean sick animals because they can be colonized by also virulent strains. And regarding the transmission routes, there are Firstly, um, one of the, the, the important ones is the vertical that happened at birth, coming from the south to the piglet, but also it's demonstrated that the respiratory via could happen from the south to the piglet, right? Also, there is another route of transmission, which is the horizontal one between piglets, specifically when the piglets are having our, uh, it, when an outbreak is happening through three main different routes, aerosols, also through the orofecal uh, via, and also another one important one that we will, we, will, we will pay attention later, saliva is one of the main sources of infection according to recent studies, okay? So another one, another route of transmission from my point of view is the digestive one. Also in humans is uh, the digestive transmission is completely demonstrated. There are some discussions between the, the researchers here in, in, our, in our sector, in, in veterinary medicine. In my opinion, um, the pig is the closest uh, model to humans, and I do believe that the digestive route is a route that we need to bear in mind, specifically when we are uh, talking about the specific serotypes like the serotype 9. We will discuss later, later on, okay? Regarding the pathogenesis, it's very simple. Here you can see an outline, an outline adapted from, from Grainer, which is the author of, of, this, of this slide, about how the, the pathogenesis, how is the pathogenesis of this, of this, uh, of this uh, bacteria. The slide is written from the top to the bottom, right? So you can see here the transmission, the three main routes of, of transmission. After the transmission, it is happening in the colonization. And once the colonization uh, happened, 
Also, the, the next step is the progression through the mucosa. And from here, we can go through a local infection or what happened, the progression to the bloodstream. And then he have, we have two options. Or we can go, or the bacteria go for a systemic infection causing septicemia, or we can go again through the local infection just causing arthritis, pneumonia, or endocarditis. That is another step, right? Which is when the bacteria is able to cross the blood brain barrier, and then it happened, one of the most important clinical signs that are, are uh, seen when we are talking about uh, strep suisse, which is meningitis. Okay, good. We leave the history here. These are general things. These are general information that you know very well. Um, and we go into the present, or which is the, what the science is telling us today. Okay, and this is to me one of the most important, uh, or one of the, the most, let's say, graphs that I have seen written in articles and also in presentations because. This graph reflects pretty well what is the reality of uh, strep suisse. The reality is that uh, we can consider uh, strep suisse as, as a patopion, which means that it's a microorganism that is belong to the commensal flora of the animals, but also it reflects that we have two phases with this bacteria, right? One is the commensal or the non virulent uh, phase, despite that when we are talking about uh, strep suisse, uh, there is a lot of virulence factors that, that you, you can see here, the capsula, the toxin solucine, some other things that are really important, uh, the FHEB uh, protein. Uh, and also we need to consider that biofilm is uh, that uh, sepsis is able to produce biofilm, right? Regulated by quorum sensing. We will, we will discuss a little bit more about, about these, uh, these uh, virulent factors. But on the other hand, we have the bad phase for strep suisse. We have the pathogenic phase or the virulent phase. And when we are talking this phase, we are talking that uh, the virulent uh, does not depend exclusively on the bacteria because there are many things that can trigger, that can develop, that can help to develop the, the disease, right? So for instance, the, there is of course uh, an individual susceptibility to the bacteria. There is new information talking about the, the possibility for small piglets, for young piglets, to suffer the disease, right? And also there are some recent works about the status of the microbiota, of the microbiome of the piglet, specifically around the, the very winning, right? Everybody knows that uh, strep suisse, the, the development of the meningitis of the clinical symptoms of strep suisse are really conditioned are really triggered by the environmental factors. Everybody knows that when our farmers, when the, when the, when the winter time is arriving to our countries, our farmers are closer to windows, and this is causing some problems with the air quality, with the ventilation and respiratory irritation, and this helps a lot to develop problems of strep suisse, right? But, and last but not least, I would like to mention that we cannot forget the concomitant. I mean, there are some specific pathogens that help a lot to the develop of strep suisse. Those of them, when we are talking about bacteria, the main three, the most important one from my point of view could be Mycoplasma hyaluronii, the old Haemophilus parasuis, now called Glacidella parasuis, and also Bordetella bronchiseptica, right? And when we are talking about uh, virus, I would say that it's worth to mention two of them. The first one is Pierce and the second one is swine influenza. Both of them are related uh, with the, the increase or the enhance or to develop the, the, the bacteria, the, the, the development of the disease because there is a strong relationship with, with, with the immune system, with the, some cells of the immune system and also with inflammation, okay? Good. I would like to go a little deeper on the virulence uh, of this bacteria because it's very, very special. Um, and I would like to, 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 to ask you for, for think about for a moment on a comparative. Think about on the virulence factors that come to your mind when we are talking about E. coli, for instance, okay? Let's, uh, let's count. How many of them come to your mind? I mean, Fimbria, F4, F5, F6, 
F18 AD, F18 AC. We have on, on one side the fimbria, and on, on, another, on, the other, on the other side we have, for instance, uh, the toxins, endotoxins, uh, thermolable toxins, uh, thermostable toxins. So, so if we pay attention to the number of the virulence factor of one bacteria, important for us because it's causing disease in many in many phases, important for us, and we can count when we are talking about uh, E. coli 15, 20 at most. Well, step two is, is a different one. There is some debate, of course, on the literature, but there are some papers that are talking about that strep suisse have 100 virulence factors. And among the, among the researchers, there, some of them are telling to us that 37 of them are considered like critical, like really important to develop the, the, to develop the disease, right? I already mentioned uh, some of them, of course, I cannot cover uh, all of them, but I would like to mention some, some important ones, which is, for instance, the, the capsule, right? So the capsule today in step suisse is one of the most important uh, virulence factors because it's able even to, to adapt the thickness of this capsule depending on the status, depending on where we can find the bacteria, whether the, whether the, uh, on the bloodstream or whether in the intestine or whether the different phases. Right. This is another important one. So strep suisse have the ability to produce some proteases that are able to destroy the EGA. So you know very well that strep suisse is a mucosal bacteria. And when we are talking about the immune system and we are talking about mucosa, one of the first line of the mucosa is the immunoglobulins, specifically the number A the name A, right? So strep suisse is so bad that it's able to destroy these, these bacteria. So somehow it's interfering with, it's just blocking the, one of the mechanisms of the defense of the, of the mucosal uh, from the immune system, right? Additionally, uh, strep suisse has developed a protein called FHP, which is one essential protein that is able to activate one of the complements pathways. So with this protein, strep suisse is able to escape from the immune system, right? There is another one, which is the sulecin, which is a very known and very well characterized uh, toxin uh, from, from strep suisse that is a crucial toxin that has a specific interaction when we are talking about the interaction of the bacteria <clears throat> and the cells. Uh, or the cells on the immune system, or even the cells on the nervous system or on the digestive system. There are some more that like the MRP or the AT, of course, I'm not gonna cover it. And here to the left, or to the, on this, on the right side of the, of the slide, there is just a representation on how could be the interaction between strep suisse and the cells of the nervous uh, central system. So the first that could be in, in four phases. So here you can see how will be the addition, right? Uh, on the second stage, you can see that probably this is the way, this is the mechanism of how the, the bacteria escaping from the, uh, from the immune system. Then there is the interaction with the bacteria and all the virulence factors with the cells of the central nervous system. And also strep suisse is so bad that it has the capacity to resist one of the mechanisms of defense of the defense that uh, the cells are, are having, which is to produce peroxides, right? So as you can see, and it's my personal opinion, maybe with, when we are talking about strep suisse, maybe we're in front of one of the most complex bacteria in big production and also with the greatest capacity to produce, let's say, pathogenic factors in, in not only in veterinary medicine, but also in humans. And this is also reflected in this slide, which is not the invasion of the central nervous system, but, but is the invasion of the digestive system, right? So this is a representation of how strep suisse could interact with the, with the intestinal cells. You can see, you can perfectly well, how many uh, factors are uh, strep suisse are having here. You can see, for, for example, these, these are some of the receptors that the intestinal cells 
are having to for for the uh, attachment of the bacteria. You can see, for instance, here how the toxin, the sulfur, is creating some pores on the intestinal cells, and this is for, for sure inducing to the apoptop, for the apoptosis of the cells. Of course, destroying the integrity of the of the walls. Right. Also, you can see, for instance, the the proteases that are able to destroy the tight junctions or and also contributing to the distraction or to the disruption of the intestinal of the intestinal uh, wall right so this is a very very interesting paper that reflects pretty well what would be the <clears throat> the interaction between strep suis when we are talking about the gut infections okay and they are making a very very nice comparative between uh, pigs and, and humans, right? So you can you know very well that uh, strep suis is a habitant that or the upper respiratory uh, nasal. But there are some uh, important researches that are uh, supporting the idea that uh, strep suis is could be also colonized and co could also cause the disease um, coming from 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 the gut. Right. So when is this happen? Well, well, this is happened when the conditions for the proliferation of the bacteria at the lumen could be a very good conditions. Right. And when these conditions are happening, when uh, this could happen? Well, in humans that you can see here in humans, these conditions are happening when you are eating raw pork. This is happening in Southeast Asia, for instance. Or this is also happening when there is a loss of the intestinal integrity of the walls. And in humans, this is happening when you're, when you're having some, some diseases, right? Like diabetes, diabetes or alcoholism, for instance. But what about peaks? When are these moments? Where are these favorable moments for the, the development of the disease? Well, it's very simple when uh, there is a sudden diet change, for instance, when we go for the liquid, the milk from the sow to the solid food at the winning, this is a one favorable moment to develop the disease. Or also when there is a loss of integration of the wall uh, of, the intestinal, of the intestinal barrier. And this is happening when we are having some co-infections either by bacteria or virus or even some coccidia or some emeria. So does it familiar for you? Indeed, this is the reason why winning is one of the most critical moments to develop of the disease because one of the things that you will learn today if you are not, uh, if you are not familiar today is that the disease is not, a, is the, the strep suis, the disease with strep suis is not starting on week five or week six where we are seeing the clinical symptoms. The disease is starting much, much earlier, right? Good. Till here, some of the, to me, one of the critical findings of what the science is telling us to today, what, what, which are the things that uh, we can learn from the science today. Of course, there are more, but we only have 40 minutes. So the idea, from, from now on is to cover what you can see reflected here. Of course, this would be another webinar, uh, every, every single point, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go very quickly around them and I will explain you which, is, which are our thoughts. So when you have a disease in any farm, if you're a veterinarian, one of the things that you have to do first is, is the clinical, is the, is, the, is the diagnostic, right? Is to diagnose the disease. And when we are talking about strep suis, uh, we need to bear in mind that it is, if you have a, 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 a little experience, it's very easy to, 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 to differentiate. The only things that you need to do is to differentiate in the case that you are having nervous uh, clinical signs with, for instance, hemophilus parasuis, or differentiate between all these bacteria that, that could cause some uh, arthritis in your piglets, right? But I would like to put your, your attention on, on the diagnostic that we are having for, for strep suis because there is a, a strong development on them, on them. So I would say that there are two main uh, strategies. One is to work with molecular techniques and another one is to work on, on 
with cellulogy, right? When we are talking about molecular techniques, we have different alternatives. Some of them even are not listed here. So I would say that the gold standard technique is the ML, uh, the MLST, which means molecular techniques, uh, which means multi-locus uh, sequencing typing, which is addressed for typing. Maybe this tool is expensive for us and maybe not applicable for, let's say, for large samples. What is a strong development, and I think that we are going to deal in the future when we are talking about diagnostic of uh, strep suisse, is this one, is the PCRs. Of course, there are some important researchers that are working with, let's say, quantitative PCRs to evaluate the load of the bacteria, right? And also, there are some developments about targeting specific genes for the identification. The identification, let's say, virulent bacteria or virulent strains, not virulent strains. And also, there are maybe not at field level, but of course, at the research level in universities or research centers, they are using, they are starting to use something that we are uh, used to, to work with another uh, virus or bacteria, which is the complete genome sequencing. Right. This is this is probably the future. This is expensive today, but when we are able to crack or to analyze the complete genome sequencing, we will be able to have a lot of information. Right. There are also some important uh, researchers talking about serology, maybe behind the molecular techniques. But uh, the intention for these uh, for these uh, researchers maybe would be to analyze what is happening with maternal immunity, and one of the things that we could use in the future with serology is to evaluate if we are finally having a vaccine to evaluate if the vaccine is producing enough antibodies or not right this is one of the things that we are going to work in the future for sure as a, as a swine beds moving to the next chap chapter of course of controlling step swiss we could be uh, this is a very busy uh, it's like don't worry uh, I, i'm not going to cover it at all uh, but um, i would like to pay you i would like you to pay attention to to me to my personal view some of the some of the key elements that i believe that we need to go uh, on a deep detail right when we are talking about biosecurity um, one of the things that we need to bear in mind is the concomitants i know that it's very easy to say you need to control the concomitants and I know that it's not that easy, specifically when we are talking about uh, peers or when we are talking about swine influenza, but some others are much, much easier, right? When we jump to the, to the pre-winning period, because this is, this is to me one of the second uh, stage, to me in the pre-winning pre phase, we need to, to bear in mind a couple of things. One is how are we processing the piglets? Pay attention to wounds, to the teeth, to nails and to needles. And another one is the pre-winning feed intake. It is crucial, the pre-winning feed intake, not only for the development of the piglet, not only for to be able to win a higher or a weighter uh, piglet, but for everything, as you will see later, okay? So once we have win the piglet, it is crucial to pay attention to the quality of the piglet. Of course, this is a big, uh, headline. Of course, uh, there are many things that can influence on that, but it is to me, to my knowledge, especially relevant the integrity of the wall. So everything that we could do to protect the integrity of the intestinal wall in this particular period will help will help us to control the uh, infection with strep suisse that it could come from from the gut, right? When we are uh, talking about treatments, um, we need to pay attention on what we treat and how we treat and how much we are injecting, right? Uh, if we are treating cells or if we are treating um, uh, specifically piglets, because these treatments, especially with antibiotics, could have a strong influence on the microbiome. And as you will see later, the microbiome could have a strong impact on the future development of not only the strep suisse disease, but many others, right? And when we are talking about hygiene, we need to bear in mind a couple of things. Um, it is really important to decrease or to lower the infection pressure, right? You need to pay attention to biofilm. 
okay? Because Strepsuris is able, it's one of these bacteria that is able to produce biofilm, and biofilm is helping to bacteria to survive, not only uh, within the peak, but also in some surfaces. So we need to clean very, very well and use some disinfectants, okay? Good. As the beds, um, every time that we are facing a disease, one of the things that come to our mind should be, okay, let's try to go for the vaccination or let's try to, to find a, a to find, uh, vaccine. Well, step two is, I would say that we, everything related to, 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 to vaccination from, a, from our point of view could be summarized here. So there are some countries where we can find some commercial vaccines um, and the results to date are not consistent because there are some reasons. I mean, maybe, not maybe, for sure is needed more research to find, let's say, a global candidate for, for vaccination. I mean, there are many serotypes, even farms or animals could be infected for, with different serotypes and there is no uh, cross protection uh, uh, among them. If we are thinking about uh, kill vaccines, maybe the production of the level of antibodies are not enough or against one of the most important uh, virulent factors like the capsule. When we are thinking about uh, virulent uh, vaccines, we need to pay attention to the virulence because you know very well that this is, this is a, a zoonosis, right? And also there is a, a, a controversy when we are talking about when we, uh, or to which category uh, we need to apply our vaccines. Should we go for the south? Should we go for the piglet? Should, should we go for, for both of them? What is happening regarding the, the maternal immunity? There is a lot of research uh, here in this area. Of course, today, one alternative uh, with some variable results, in some cases, very good results, in some others, not, not so good with uh, autogenous vaccines. So to me, the most important uh, key issue with, uh, with the autogenous vaccines is where to find the strain that is causing uh, disease in my operation, in my farm. We need to go for meningi meningitis or spleen or joints because all these strains that we can find in the lung or in the tonsils or in the nasal cavity may not be the ones that are really causing problems to, to, to our farm, right? And of course, uh, this is a strong and really important disease in the swine production worldwide. There is no country free of that. And uh, there are some research uh, try, trying to find the future vaccine. Maybe one of the concepts could be a viral live vaccine made by subunits, con taking into consideration some of the crucial, let's say, of the pathogenicity factors, right? Good. It's pretty clear that uh, till now we haven't found what uh, uh, the, the ideal solution. It's pretty clear that the, the, there are some debates regarding the, the vaccination as you have seen uh, right now. Now we have some tools which is mainly or basically to use, let's say, antibiotics through, through the feet or through the, through the water. But we need to look for alternatives, as you, will, as you will see later. And one of these alternatives, in our opinion, should come from the gut, right? Um, you know very well which is uh, some of the functions that the gut are having, and you know very well that there is a, an important, uh, let's say, increase of knowledge about what is happening at gut level. You know very well that uh, the gut is, is the largest uh, immune system in the body, and there is a clear connection between the microbiome, the immune system, and, and also on the brain. The microbiome, for sure, you know very well that it's a trendy concept, right? And from my point of view, it's a very powerful tool that it has a lot of potential, not only for strep suicide, but for, for many reasons, in, not only in veterinary medicine, but also in humans. That is, they are making molecular uh, analysis together with, let's say, very complex uh, bioinformatic uh, calculations, and everybody's looking for for to having to have a healthy microbiome, right? But um, what is the definition of uh, what is what is our target when we are talking about to, to have a healthy microbiome? What are we looking for? Well, what we are looking for is is to have a high bacterial diversity, 
within peaks. This is what we call with the with the, the researchers are called are calling alpha diversity. But also we are looking that this high diversity would be would very low between peaks. So we are looking for a, a huge amount of different genera of bacteria in our peaks, but we are looking also for a low variation in our operation. Right? So this combination is, is critical. Also, we are looking for, for absence of dysbiosis. Also, we are looking for absence of pathogens, but also, and this is an important one, we are looking for some microbiome, some bacteria able to help or to produce substances that can help or can avoid or can inhibit uh, the growth of the bad ones. So this is more or less the definition of a healthy microbiome. And the question would be, okay, can we influence somehow the microbiota when we are specifically talking about strep suisse? The answer from my point of view is yes, but it's not that easy. And we need to look uh, back in the piglet because you know very well that everything on the life of one piglet that is arriving to the slaughterhouse is starting at birth. And there is a lot of influence on the birth. It is a lot of in influence on the winning. And it, a lot of, it is a lot of influence on the entrance, on the fattening period, right? And here you can see one of the uh, one research coming from uh, Kansas University from, from Megan near, near the Wormer, they were taking a look about which are the factors that can influence on the microbiome of one piglet here that can be influenced around the whole life. And you can see how many factors. I mean, from the moment or the way to deliver the piglet, also this, the, the feed, the sow's diet, the, even the sow's microbiome, all the environment, all how the, the piglets are eating, or how we are processing the piglets, or the amount of antibiotics that we are injecting on, on our piglets, or the exposure to the different pathogens, or even the amount of, uh, let's say, AGPs or antibiotics or, or substances that can grow. All these, but all these uh, things could be a potential influence on the microbiome. So all these things are happening on a very short period of time, and all these things have a strong influence on the microbiome for strep suis. For not only for strep suis, for all the respiratory uh, for all the respiratory processes. But is there anything in particular for strep suis? And the answer is that yes, there are some uh, recent papers, recent researchers coming from two sides, to my knowledge. One uh, is a, a strong collaboration between Baveningen University and one research center here in Spain, which is called IRTA. They are developing a European project because, of course, the implications of these bacteria on the zoonosis and how it's affecting to humans. And they were <clears throat> making a very interesting research just they were comparing the microbiome of healthy animals comparing with sick animals at the palatine tonsil level. They were doing that on a sequence way. Of course, you cannot see anything here. Don't worry. It's, this is the, the result of the different bacteria through the different stages. And they were comparing which was the main difference between the healthy and the sick animals. And they start detecting, of course, some difference. When we are talking about specific microbiome related to, to strep suisse, right? So the first thing that they detect, of course, as you can imagine, is that the sick piglets show a reduced diversity. But this was not happening on the week five or on the week seven. This was happening one week before the winning. So one of the important to me conclusions from this research was that uh, the triggering point to the development of strep suis is not starting on the week five. It's starting when we are suffering some other disruption on the pre-winning period, right? On the second study, they analyze 
which were the main genera that they were they were finding at the Donson level, right? And they found that uh, there were three main species, Moraxella, Athenobacillus, and Strepsuis. These three of them were the ones that they consider key uh, genera that they were having, they were keeping the tonsillar stable uh, of the microbiome at the tonsillar level. Another really important uh, finding for them was that they were finding a correlative, pos uh, a positive correlation between Moraxella and health. What does that mean? That all the piglets that were suffering less problems with strep suis, they, have, they had on their microbiome a higher number of Moraxellas. And also they found a really interesting thing which was a negative correlation between strep suis and these two ones, which, which could possibly be interpreted like, okay, maybe if we are having rotia and prebotalacia in our microbiome, these two could produce some substances that can have, somehow could inhibit the development of some of the uh, mechanisms of uh, strep suis, right? Okay, it is evident that uh, when we are uh, thinking about microbiome, uh, 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 immediately our mind goes to, to the gut, right? But strep suis is, is a different one. It's a very special one. Uh, when we are talking about microbiome in strep suis, we need to bear in mind uh, other things, other, other, other regions. And this is a very interesting um, study coming from one uh, Japanese uh, research center together with uh, some Vietnamese. They were analyzing which was the microbiome of different uh, ways. They were analyzing the microbiome of the saliva, of the fecal, of the vagina, and also they were analyzing the feeders and the drinkers of the, of the, of the farms. And the results are very interesting for the future. <clears throat> of course, you cannot see anything here, but you just pay attention to the red color, please. Because this is, you can see the red is the representation of the strep suis, right? You can see this is the microbiome of the saliva. You can see that this is the microbiome of the feces. You can see that this is the microbiome of the vagina. And also this is the microbiome of the feeder and also of the drinker, right? So. One thing, one of the conclusions from this study was that regardless the age, because this is the evolution of the uh, samples through the time, so this is uh, different ages, you can see in red how strep suis is completely present in the saliva of the animals, right? So the conclusion for them is that strep suis is one pathogen that they like to leave on the saliva. It's absolutely present. And this is one of the key elements to take into account when we are thinking about the future. So to me, and this is for the nutritionist, uh, to me, the nutritional approach could come from this way. We need to probably work on, okay, if strep suis is living on the saliva, maybe what we need is try to find a way to reduce the amount of, uh, let's say, nutrients for this bacteria to develop at this level. And also when we are thinking about alternatives, we need to bear in mind what is happening at the, uh, let's say, at the oral uh, cavity, okay? Good. I'm arriving to the, to the end of the presentation and I would like to, to explain you very briefly um, why we should look for, for alternatives. Don't uh, get me wrong. Um, uh, I'm pro uh, antibiotics, of course, because antibiotics are saving lives. It's a very, very good tool in humans and, and also in veterinary medicine. And that's why we need to preserve uh, them and, and use them on, on the appropriate way. The issue is that when we are thinking about the control of strep suis, at least to my knowledge, to, well, to my remembrance, um, we have been using uh, antibiotics, amoxicillin, in feed and in water during at least 30 years, 35, something like that. 
And I just wanted to show you this paper. It's a recent paper talking about what is the interaction between the antibiotics and also the gastric test in the gastrointestinal microbiome, right? And it has four negative effects. I'm not going to cover, of course, but pay attention to just these four headlines, I would say. It is the interaction when we are having a lot of antibiotics on our gut, we are reducing the diversity of our, of our microbiome, right? If we are, uh, we are aiming for the other, for exactly the opposite, well, we are looking to control some of the pathogens. We are looking for diversity, not to reduce the diversity, right? There is also a, a weakening of the immune system. And also there is an increase when we are having a lot of antibiotics, there is an increase on the inflammation on the local, on the, on the gut, right? But not only that, because what, when we are using a lot of antibiotics during, during a lot of time, what we are doing is increasing the selection of resistant bacteria. And this is a very serious problem for humans in the future. And also we are interacting to the, to the, with the metabolic level, right? But this is not the, the only thing that we need to bear in mind, okay? Because the most serious thing is, is something that appears with this article coming from Thailand last year. <clears throat> Thailand is one of the countries where they are having more cases of meningitis in humans uh, as a consequence of this soup that I was mentioned before. And what they did, these researchers uh, in collaboration with Marcelo Gorchev, what they did was to evaluate a huge amount of serotypes, a, new, a huge amount of isolates. They were evaluating the antimicrobial susceptibility in humans and in pigs, right? And uh, the conclusions were really, really uh, scared because when we are talking about their results, uh, their strains were two, more than 200 results. All of them were resistant to microlytes or tetracyclines. Some of them were had uh, intermediate resistance sensi sensi sensitivity to penicillin, gentamicin, or rifloxacin. And of course, they were looking for uh, the, the products that are having today, beta-lactamics and flopernicol. So the conclusions from this study is, okay, guys, we need to pay attention because having a look to this uh, huge amount of bacteria with this level of resistance to these antibiotics, we need to look for, for alternatives, okay? And when we are looking for alternatives, what, would, what do we have right now? Well, we have some molecules, we have some products, we have some, we need to look for, for, for molecules that are able to slow or even to inhibit the bacteria's growth. I would say that uh, there are no Silver, sil silver ballots. We have several options, like, uh, like you can see here. We have phytomolecules, we have medium chain fatty acids, we have organic acids, we have prebiotics and probiotics, and maybe uh, we are forgetting, uh, I'm forgetting some of them. We have different uh, mechanisms of action, but at the end, probably the solution, it is a combination for some of them, okay? So this is the last slide. Um, to me, strep psoas is, is a very interesting, a very complex bacteria, and maybe there are many things that we don't know yet. Uh, many, many things. Uh, it is a pathogen, but it has two phases, uh, and there are some factors that are, could be influence this bacteria. To me, and this is uh, for, for specifically for the field beds, to me, strep psoas together with uh, um, with E. coli will be one of the one of the key elements that we will we will work with uh, on the nursery as a consequence of the the reduction of zinc and also the reduction of antibiotics. And to me, control strep psoas is very complicated when we are talking about uh, these bacteria because it requires an holistic approach that uh, co-infections could play a key role. Again. We need to look back when we are talking about strep psoas. We need to look back because uh, what what is happening at the beginning of the life of the piglets, it has a strong influence, and the control of these bacteria will come from the gut, interacting with the microbiome and putting 
on the gut on the intestinal wall of our uh, of our piglets a plus on stabilization together with the systemic uh, control right and with that i'm ready to take some some of the questions that you may have thank you very much for your attention and let's go for the questions thank you Rafa. while we are here waiting for the questions we do have a couple of questions quite interesting questions i believe that would be more suitable for you as a vet to answer them. I just want to highlight a couple of things from your webinar. And for me as a, as a nutritionist, it's impressive to see that how Streptococcus is and the way that we are looking at Streptococcus is changing over the years. And so we see more and more studies uh, suggesting that the gastrointestinal tract may be one of the main niche for the pathogens like Streptococcus is. And this will lead, of course, to consequences that we know. Uh, Streptococcus is acting on the, on the surface of the cells, causing disruption of tight junctions. And you mentioned also that Streptococcus has a lot of virulence factors. So this could be one effect of having Streptococcus is in the gastrointestinal tract, but also general dysbiosis in the gut. So there's one specific study, and we have been discussing that, showing that not only the intestinal, there's not only that there's intestinal translocation of this specific pathogen, but also this path or the intest gastrointestinal tract will lead to central nervous uh, symptoms. So even mm -hmm. the streptococcus suis coming from the gastrointestinal tract can lead to classical symptoms of streptococcus suis infection. And furthermore, uh, you have, uh, we have to think about the role of streptococcus suis as a zoonotic pathogen, right? Uh, if we have, and there are a lot of studies proving that the streptococcus can be abundant in the intestine, so you can find them in the intestine at weaning already. So we also have to understand the role of excretion of streptococcus suis in the feces and how this will provide or how this will become uh, a dangerous situation for human infection. So for me as a nutritionist and for the nutritionists that are on this in this webinar, it's quite important to understand the importance of the gastrointestinal tract in such infections. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Rafa, we have uh, two questions that are related from Bernie Gleason. And first was, uh, what is the best method to determine prevalence of uh, streptococcus suis in, mm -hmm. in the farm? And the second that is, is related, uh, it's related with the, the, the presence in the saliva of a streptococcus. And he's asking if, if um, uh, the presence of, uh, of uh, a streptococcus is for sure in, in the saliva, uh, uh, a way to determine the, uh, the amount of, uh, of the prevalence of the, the streptococcus. But, what about uh, the oral mucose uh, and if tonsillar prevalence is correlated with? Well, the, for, um, thanks for, for the question. Um, I would say that we need to first evaluate why we want to evaluate the prevalence of the disease because uh, the prevalence will be uh, very high in, in any case. So the, the best way to evaluate uh, any prevalence of any disease uh, is, is sampling. The best way to sample strep suis today, to my knowledge, is uh, having uh, tonsillar uh, swaps. This is the best way. There are some, some more aggressive methods, but this is the, this is the best way. And regarding the, the saliva, uh, and I think that this is, this is something that we are going to work on the on the future very high. I mean, I was mentioning that uh, there is a strong development of the PCRs, uh, specifically PCRs targeting uh, uh, quantitative PCRs and also um, PCRs targeting different, um, let's say, um, specific genes, genes that could be correlated with uh, virulence or not. I think that one of the tools that we will have in the future are uh, for sure, PCRs coming from saliva. And the correlation between the saliva and the tonsils, I don't know, because at the tonsils, you can find a lot of strep suis. Um, you, you should probably go for uh, certification of the strep suis. So, but to me, the question, the important thing is, why do you want to, to know 
the prevalence because at the end the treatment will be more or less the same. There is a hundred percent of the farms are infected and a huge amount of piglets are, let's say, infected on, on the day two, even on the day two of, of, of their birth. Correct. There's, there's, a, question. Yeah, yeah. there's an interesting question here, Hafa. I think we can all comment on that. Is there a miracle product to control this bacteria? Uh, well, we, uh, we are involved in the, in the pig industry and we all know that so far there's no specific product that can control the bacteria. Hafa presented a couple of alternatives here, but what is clear for everybody is that we do have to take actions and we do have to use the well-known uh, multidisciplinary approach. Uh, so if we think about that the gastrointestinal tract is one of the main routes, we also have to consider the diet. If we think that uh, the transmission can be also oral, uh, fecal oral, we have to think about hygiene and biosecurity in the farm. So we do have, and of course, this question is most probably related to specific additives that can be used in the diets to control streptococcus suis from a gastrointestinal point of view. And we do have some data on that. There's a lot being done recently. We do have some specific products as Hafa showed here uh, before, but all of them are still in a phase that they are promising, that's correct, but still inconclusive, right? So we do have a lot of MIC and MBC for, uh, for example, phytomolecules and proving that phytomolecules have a specific effect. We do have also some MIC with lauric acid proving that lauric acid has also an effect. Organic acid is the same. So we're still under evaluation, I would say. So far for us, and half of please comment on that, for us, the best way to, to target and to focus this specific pathogen is working in a, in a more broad way in the farms. Yeah, correct. I mean, strepsis is, a, is, a, is not an easy one that you add one product and you can control it. This is happening with with amoxicillin, that's that's true. I mean, you can you you can have an after and before the amoxicillin, but uh, amoxicillin is is something that will be reduced. Even there are some producers that are are uh, trying to remove because they need to, to look for for different alternatives. There are no single valids, and I and as I said, Strepsuis has two phases and has a lot of interactive factors that could uh, trigger the disease. And related with, to this, I, I want, there is another question here, um, that um, they were trying to relate uh, the greasy pig and also the, the strep suis. And I would say that there is no relationship between both of them or as a disease, but probably they have a common cause. Because when you're having a problem of, uh, of uh, greasy pig, that means that you are having problems of mm, on the skin. Maybe you are having some wounds. If you are having some wounds, probably one of the things that is happening on the lactation period is that the processing of the piglets are not being clean enough. And if the processes of the piglets are not clean enough, maybe that would be uh, one route for the two bacteria that are causing uh, this disease. Staphylococcus aureus in the case of the, of the greasy pig and strepsuis in the case of the meningitis, right? Um, there is another question here uh, coming from Art Frio. They say that strepsuis appears in highly sanitized farms, maybe because the top bacteria are, are already under control. Maybe, um, maybe yes. Uh, well, there are two, I would say that there are two, two bacteria that uh, can appear on the very high sanitized, uh, on a very high health status farms. And one of them is Strep Suisse. Yes, of course. Another one is uh, Stemophilus parasuis. Yeah. Let me check. Would strep suis, we have another question here coming from Jax Glober, Glob, Glob, Globerar. Would a strep suis play a role in ongoing erosis in young wing piglets? Mm, I don't know, I don't think so. But again, uh, when you look at the farms and you are having some ear necrosis, ear necrosis can be related to two different things. 
One is, let's say, stress and cannibalism. Stress and cannibalism uh, could come from low ventilation, and this, the low ventilation, has a clear impact on the development of stress suites. Okay, and the other one, the other reason that could could cause ear necrosis is mycotoxins. Mycotoxins can play a role in many things because they're influenced on the immune system. So um, the answer is yes and no. When you are having ear necrosis, you, you need to pay attention first to these two main uh, origins, mycotoxicosis and then ventilation. Ventilation, ventilation or environmental conditions, let's say, maybe density or some other factors. And those of them can influence on strep suisse without any kind of doubt. Uh, related with this question, uh, there are some studies uh, that demonstrate the role of uh, sarcovirus uh, type 2 uh, in some uh, uh, questions uh, related with ear necrosis. And uh, Strepto could be a secondary agent that uh, could uh, use the damage caused by sarcovirus mm -hmm, to colonize these uh, lesions in the uh, tip of the ears, okay, but not by themselves, usually. Yeah, we have an interesting question from coming from Sam, the snoic. Do you think that enhancing saliva production with supplementing certain additives might be helpful in the combat of uh, against strep suisse? I don't know, to be honest. I don't know if uh, to enhance the saliva production could help to reduce the disease or just in the, just in the opposite way. What I do know is that, uh, because the research is that we need to, to pay attention to all the products, all the additives that we will use in the future need to reach the saliva because uh, strep suisse is one of these bacteria that they like to live, to live in the saliva. Even if you, if you uh, remember, the Japanese study uh, took the samples on the feeders and all the drinkers because that would be one of the places where uh, strep suisse can be uh, a source of infection. And remember, strep suisse can produce also biofilm, so drinkers and feeders could be one important point of contamination through the saliva of infected pits, of course. Yeah, we have another another question coming from China. In the last few years, uh, we don't get many cases in China, maybe due to the massive use of antibiotics. Uh, in this July, we will fully forbid the additive antibiotics in feed. What kind of issues we will meet in strep suisse and how should we prepare for this? Okay, thanks, Chen Fei, for, for the question. Uh, of course, uh, I've been working in China, as you know very well, uh, many years, and the main reason because you, you haven't had any case is because you are controlling the disease through, through antibiotics. And the issues that you are going to have is the issues that uh, I show you in, in the presentation. You need to be ready because strep suisse is a bacteria that in, in some uh, part, some particular conditions and in, in China, unfortunately, you have uh, very aggressive pathogens or very aggressive, for instance, um, virus strains or swine influenza or even PD or even uh, some problems that for sure can contribute to the, the to the development of the um, of the of the strep suisse. So you are going to suffer a little bit. I'm sorry for you. <laughs> and we have another question coming from from Romeo. Nice talk. Do you think that there is a possibility that a virulent strain can become virulent once once they are co-infected with peers, and when they are translocated somehow to a different place, say from oral cavity to gut? Well, um, I don't know. I cannot. I don't have the knowledge to um, to answer this question. What I do know is that. Uh, in farms or in animals, you can have you can have two different uh, uh, 
kind of uh, strains, virulent ones and a virulent uh, and a virulent ones. I don't know if uh, the virulent strains of strep suisse can uh, can become on virulent ones, triggering by by some of the diseases. I don't know. I don't really know that that question. I will check it. Or I will contact some of the my my favorite researchers, and I will let you know. Some more questions that you may have. Okay, so if you don't have more questions, um, I would like to thank you again for, for, for your participation in the seminar. I would like to ask you a couple of minutes to, to fill uh, a poll that I will send you in a minute. Uh, if any of you uh, have uh, any additional question, please let us know through this email that you can see on, on the screen. This is the email, this is a general email that our colleagues that will address to the technical department. Uh, please uh, feel, help us to improve, help us to let you know, uh, help us to let us know which are the things that you like it or you don't like it about this webinar because this is a, a new way of working as a consequence of the pandemic. I would like to thank you all again for your attendance to the webinar. Thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to my team, which is in the, in the other side. And please uh, fill the poll and thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you.